wandered alone. I wandered alone down Sin's lonesome valley, lonely and sad, till I heard a sweet voice. Till I heard a sweet voice saying, Sinner, come home, Sinner, come home. I needed the call. I needed the call. Came to him and repented.
We just pray, Father, that you'll hand us down in our grave in peace with you and toward all mankind as much so as it lies possible. And on the morning of the great resurrection, Father, raise us, own us, and crown us at thy right hand. All of these favors and blessings we all be made through the lovely name of Jesus. And amen. Amen. Put it in gear. On the resurrection morning, when all the dead in Christ shall rise.
pleasure this evening. I've been looking forward to it. People last us sometimes why why we like to go and the reason we like to go and stuff. But you know, I, I enjoy God's people. Amen. Yes. I feel feel I feel more free here than I would by myself or with a bunch of people that you know. But before we go to the Lord in prayer, anybody have an unspoken request? Yeah. And let your request be known. Just remember Judy Carroll saying that. Yes. Always remember me and mine, and remember Val McClellan. He's in the hall. Remember our home. Uh, I remember my mom and her home. She's not been feeling good this week. And uh, we've got a neighbor up there that's, uh, that's been going to church a little bit. And uh, just remember him. You got your seat saved at the church. She said, I know God intervened on me. She said, I plan on really coming. She said, that's got me thinking. So we can all think, we can think and override everything. Good Lord bless us with. Ain't you glad he didn't get halfway there and quit? Amen. Yeah, yes. Just think, glad he went all the way. But even to the point he got done, he said, he said he just finished. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then he sent it, I think, brought the commission out and brought us in and made us part of what he ever found the beauty that he given us to hope for. Uh, Brother Bruce mentioned one of them songs. Think about the good promises that he's given us. He's not slack. We sometimes we wonder, we'll pray, we'll pray and miss things like it. Uh, kind of hoping for a better answer than we got. But Sometimes our answer is no. That's right. That's right. But we ought to accept that just as well. Amen. Way. That's right. Because he knows what's best. He knows what's best. And, and uh, our boy loved me one time. He was still in high school. Tony went to school with him, I'm sure. He yeah. told me one time, he says, uh, Dad says, you seem awful happy. I said, hey, buddy. I said, uh, I am happy. I said, it just seems like everything's a, I've got a pretty good promotion at work. Things are going pretty good. I guess I said, things are going real good. I said, I'm happy at church. Got a lot of people coming to church and stuff. I said, just seem like crazy every time I pray. Just that laying out. He said, damn, man, when you're while you're in that good mood, ask me a million bucks. He said, I can sure use it. <laughs> I said, we were praying for a different stuff. But it, it's good to be here this evening. I'm, I'm thankful. I've looked forward to this all week and, and yes. I appreciate it. Nathaniel's got a pretty bad surgery coming up next week. I want you to pray for the doctor. God will bless him. Bless the hand that uses the knife. I got a request yesterday for uh, Brother James Parsley, one of our ministers. Uh, they said he's getting to where he gets lost if he gets out. And, and, uh, he's just not able to, to uh, get around. Well, George, I got a strong burden tonight. The Bible teaches us to pray with and for yes. one another. So tonight I'd like for you all to pray with me. I know there's other brothers and sisters that's going through burdens, going through problems, and the Lord knows all about it. Mm -hmm. Amen. So let's 
Tonight I'd like to do something a little different. I'd like to get a verse of, one verse of amazing grace. I'd like for as many as would, I say this often, I'd like for as many as would to move up this way if you're able to kneel down up here. If you're not, sit up front here. And let's go to the Lord. He's able to hear us. And we need each other. Yes, we do. Amazing grace.
pray, Lord, that when this life's over, that you'll take us home to glory to forever be with you. In that upper and better kingdom, that house not made with hands, eternally in the heavens. All of these favors and blessings weigh on me back through Christ Jesus, our risen Savior. And amen. Amen. Pray for them. We may need prayer. And sometimes we pray in this. How many times? And I, I've said it. I've said it for years. Remember my wife. Remember my wife. Yeah. I keep. I keep every day several times. Lord help her. I've seen a, a decline in her physical ability and in her thinking. And I can see that where she got that dementia and stuff. I can see that. But I'm serious. About I seriously pray for God's people because many sometimes we rush you through it. And I don't Amen. know anybody's problem. Yep. But while we pray there, I hush and listen to these brothers in prayer. Yep. God can. That's right. Take mm -hmm. that take that home with you. You sleep on it. God can. And if you're lost, he's saved. Amen. Amen. Now he expects us to come to his Amen. time. Yeah. Lord, brother, he ain't gonna change that. He's got that, but you know the beauty of this. I look it's often at these old church pictures we look at that's been going on for years and years. And how do we look at that? God still can. He ain't aged not one minute from the time that he said let us in the book of Genesis when he started. He ain't never aged not one bit. And he'll be right there. Full fellowship. On that day, while the evil Savior <coughs> Now listen to this. Listen to this. What a beautiful thought this is. The old man from the heart. Not because somebody was beating and thumping on me to try to get me into this, but through that sweet spirit that he let me realize that I was lost. And then he yeah. sent preachers to preach yeah. to me. Yeah. Even to the point when it come time that I got ready for the church, he had fellows plumb willing to wade the water and yes. baptize me. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Cold water just went down. It's cold. Fourth day of April. That water went down. How, how did he always provide for me? Heart crushed all the pieces. Didn't know what he was going to do and what way to turn. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Yes. You know what I heard? I heard the prayers of his saints. Yeah. Amen. Amen. I didn't feel like praying. I felt I felt all to be. I knew I could, but gathering with people, the brothers and the sisters, at a time of great great sorrow, I could still I could still hear them brothers and sisters, and that just like the sound yeah. he spoke of that yeah. prophet come back. God is everything, That's right. and He wants us to lean on to Him. Amen. He saved our soul yeah. That's for right. a purpose to where He would be magnified. And you can see people running around with tambourines, softies, harps, whatever. 
but he wants us to obey from the heart and worship him yes. in spirit and in truth with an understanding. And if you've been down to that wonderful river of water of life and you put your troubles on him, yeah. he is perfectly happy to answer Amen. our prayer and Amen. help Amen. us and strengthen us. Praise Did Lord. you know sometimes they heal refuse to, he'll, he'll answer our prayer not the way we want it, yeah. but bless God, he'll answer it to strengthen us yeah, and something. Yeah. It's been many a times I've probably prayed for stuff that wouldn't have been real good for me if he'd answered, yeah. but through the steadfastness and that born again spirit of looking to him, and I know beyond this place of tears what we're looking at, the sadness and the perseverance that we look at, that there is a land of perfect rest. People said, I don't know exactly what yeah. it looks like. I know one thing. It is a land without sorrow. Yeah. It is a land where there's joy, peace, and comfort. Yeah. People, well, there ain't no river of water of life if there was. You can see it. Did you know that they was many years ago up in Martinsburg, West Virginia, put together? Big old satellite 58 feet across. And they could look and listen and wait for stuff to click. And I was just a youngster. And I watched these fellas come from England. And there was a big old boy there. had his hair green back, big glasses. He walked over and looked down in one of them screens. And he just shook his head. He said, I've seen things in that that I ain't never seen before. Yeah. But you know what? At one time. That they ever looked on them gates of pearl and walls of jasper, but they're there. Amen. And I'll tell you something else. On April the 12th, 1981, the angels rejoiced up there. The but Lord. I got saved. They didn't hear that, Amen. but they did. Amen. And that's the joy of this. This is a far faith finding Amen. out. Amen. And only the Spirit of our God can reveal it to you, and it is His fullness. Thank you, Lord. He gives you everything Amen. we need. Praise yeah. the Lord. I'm not much on bringing up a service, but I love you. You're, not good, You're a fine, fine, good, steadfast Amen. brother. And I appreciate your fellow and hospitality and love that you showed me. And I feel just as comfortable here as I do anywhere on this earth. More satisfied right here than I can find at my dwelling place, <laughs> brother, brother. Yeah. In the fellowship of his people and his saintly people, I feel comfortable right here, just as good and as free as a bird. Oh, brother, get Mark of a bird away today. Did you ever catch a little bird and pick it up like that, and then when you turn it loose, it flies away a chirp? He said, Let everything that hath voice praise ye the Lord, that little bird. That's how I feel free. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank Praise you. the Lord. I love you. I appreciate you. I love you, you brother. brother. I appreciate you. Thank the Lord. Time. Sister Vicky, sing a song for us. You feel like it. I think the Lord's been so good. <clears throat>
has been a lot of time at Calvary, kneeling before the Lamb. His blood makes everything whiter than snow. When I come just as I am, and as I the ground for the heart that was burdened on my way up is shouting victory walking back down yes the heart that was burdened on my way up is shouting victory walking back down I don't mean to take the time, Brother Tony, but I felt so good to see you and singing that song, Brother Tony. Sure. I wanted to say, I wanted to say something, Brother Tony, because I had to sit there in my seat. I tell you about the type, about the power of prayer. I said a prayer one time, Brother Tony. I know that it wrecked my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ because I knew that it done it because it was an honest prayer, Brother George. Amen. I knew that it wrecked him because as long as you give an honest, powerful prayer, Brother Noah, as long as you do that, I know that it wrecked him. I know that it did because I know that it went there. As long as you do that, Brother, as long as you do that, the power of prayer will work wonders. Yeah. Worked yeah. wonders. People don't believe that. I believe it because I've seen it work. I've seen it work, Brother George, time and time again. I know that it works. I love the Lord today. I can't believe how much people just don't believe, Brother Tony. I love the Lord today. The prayer works. I know that it works. If people just would grasp on to the Lord before it's everlasting too late. I don't know if there's a sinner in the house, Brother Tony, but I beg to the sinner people of this world to get a hold of the Lord before it's everlasting too late. It's a good place, it's a good way to be here, Brother yeah. Tony, but it's not easy. If it was easy, Brother Tony, everybody would want it. Everybody would want it, wouldn't they, Brother Bruce? But it's a good it's a good way to be. I'm glad that he walked into my life. I wouldn't I wouldn't have any other way, Brother Tony. Yeah. I truly wouldn't. Thank God for what we felt here tonight. Thank you all. It's good that we pray together. It's good that we, the Bible teaches us, weep with them that weep, mourn with them that mourn. Brother Tom, go right here. Brother Don, Don Mayer always calls me on Saturday and asks me what I learned in Bible study. <laughs> and tomorrow, I'll get to tell him I went to Bible study class in a worship service program. Yeah. yeah. I'm, looking, I'm looking forward to telling him that tomorrow. Amen. He'll rejoice with me. He'll, he'll be on the road talking on his headset, but he'll rejoice with me. Amen. At a worship service yeah. at Bible. You're right, brother. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, you, brother Tom. Praise the Lord. I'm thankful for this. He'd be lifted up. He'd draw all in. That's right. Yeah. That's right. That's good. Good thing. I've told y'all over and over. We can worship him anytime we're together. We can worship him. Amen. Whether we're by ourselves at home, in the church house, just sitting down by ourselves reading this book right here, we can worship him. Amen. And I'm thankful for that. What a blessing it is. Oh, Book of Acts, chapter 4. Read down through here, and we'll go back and start where we left off next week. Verse 1, And as they spake unto the people, the priests, and the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came unto them, being grieved that they taught the people, and preached through Jesus, the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in hold 
unto the next day, for it was now eventide. Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about 5,000. And it came to pass on the morrow that their rulers, and elders, and scribes, and Annas the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, by what power or by what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to this impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even him doth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Amen. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Amen. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled, and they took knowledge of them, that they had been with Jesus. And beholding the man which was healed, standing with them, they could say nothing against it. And when they had commanded that they been, when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council and conferred among themselves, saying, "What shall we do to these men? For this, for that indeed." A notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny. But that it spread no further among the people, let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all or teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people. For all men glorified God for that which was done. For the man was above 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing was shown. And being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. And when they had heard, when they had heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which hast made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that in them is, who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against Christ. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together, for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word, by stretching forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by thy name of thy holy child Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord, and great grace was upon them all. Neither was there any among them that lacked, 
For as many as were possessors of land or houses sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet. And distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. And Joseph, who, was the, who, was, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite, and of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it, and brought the money, and laid it at the apostles' feet. All right. All right. Let's back up here. What a great, great message this is right here of how that God starts working in his church and how that he was blessing these folks down through here. And uh, what you're going to find as we kind of go down through this, where we started last week in chapter 4, 1, I think we got down uh, maybe the first three or four verses, but those first four verses we find Peter and John are taken up uh, sort of like a warrant from the priests, that group of high ups of the Jews there was gathered together and uh, they, they put them in jail. Came to evening time and they'd been there quite a while. If you remember over in chapter 3, it was about the third hour as they were going up from there, if I'm not mistaken, or the ninth hour, I'm sorry. About the ninth hour is when they were going up to the temple to pray. And then all of this began to take place. This man was healed of his infirmity. He started leaping and praising God. And Peter stood up there right in the midst of that temple where they were all gathered. And he began to preach to those Jews that were there that day by the same spirit that they began to receive back there on the day of Pentecost. Do you remember how when the spirit came down and he was blessed on the day of Pentecost to stand up, he addressed those Jews that were there. He got very plain with them. He went straight to the scriptures and pulled out the Old Testament scripture that they had at that time, letting them know this was the Christ that you all have taken him by wicked hands and crucified. As soon as they saw that, the, the church was growing and the, the, the Lord was adding to the church. And we come over to chapter 4 and they're going up, continuing doing the Lord's work at the hour of prayer. And uh, when this miracle takes place and all those Israelites, Jewish men are gathered there in that temple area, the courtyard we would on Solomon's porch. Uh, that that boy started running and following them from the gate that was called Beautiful, ran with them and leaped and jumped all the way through the temple yard up to Solomon's porch and was following them and grabbed a hold of them and was right there with them, leaping and praising God. And all those people that were there knew that man. He'd been laying there. He was 40 years old, been laying there for all this time. They knew him. They knew it was the man that had been crippled. And here they're seeing him leaping and praising God. And as he takes another opportunity to stand and talk to these folks that were gathered there, he gets pretty plain with them and he starts preaching to them Jesus again. And he lets them know about a resurrected Savior that got up from the dead. And uh, as he went through there and all this took place and uh, uh, those, those high ups didn't like that very well. Those folks that were the, of the high priest and the, the scribes, the chief captain that we studied last week, this upset them when they heard that. We talked about those Sadducees. They didn't even believe in a resurrection. If you remember last week, we went over on in the book of Acts and we found the scripture where it said that the Sadducees, they didn't believe in an afterlife. They didn't believe in a resurrection. They didn't believe in angels. They just uh, uh, were a group. When they heard Paul and Peter and all these brothers start talking about the resurrection, they got angry and they started trying to do away with these boys when they started preaching that. So we talked about the temple. We talked about last week the captain of the temple. We talked about the Sadducees there in verse 1. They were grieved with what they were teaching the people there in verse 2 because it was the resurrection and they didn't believe a resurrection. Now we got the Sadducees and the Pharisees. They, they're at odds on that. One group believes it and the Sadducees don't believe it. Verse 3, they laid hands on them. These Peter and John, because of this healing in the name of Jesus and preaching the resurrection, they laid hands on them and they put them in hold or put them in, in uh, we would say, stocks or handcuffs of some sort and put them where they were chained down. They put them in hold unto the next day for it was now eventide. Now remember when all this started, it was about three o'clock in the day, the ninth hour. So all this is gone and it's got down to eventide and it's dark. And uh, it said in verse 4 there, How be it many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about 
thousand. Now remember what took place there. Peter has been standing and preaching to these Jews there in chapter 3 when this man was healed. And people believed what Peter had preached to them. Why? Not just because it was Peter, but because the Holy Ghost came down and was being a witness to those folks. He used that man that was there as a witness with signs and wonders. That's how the infant church began to get its start was with these miracles and signs and wonders. The speaking of tongues that took place over there in chapter 2 that we studied about. God used that to get their attention in the infancy of this church. That's why we see today that he uses the pure gospel message in the New Testament scriptures when that which is perfect is come and we've got her tonight. How glad I am today that we've got this new covenant. We've got this new dispensation. We've got these words that he's placed in this New Testament scripture that are life, that they're power, and we can begin to see what God can do because of what that he done through his son, his word, and I thank God for that. So people heard that and they were saved and they believed. And as we go down through this chapter, <clears throat> you're going to find as we look at verses 5 through 7, this, this committee, if you will, the Sanhedrin of this group of people, we're going to look at them, and this, this group of this uh, elders, they're, they're going to listen to what's taking place here and they're going to tell those boys you don't do it no more. But we find that they didn't listen to that and they went right on preaching. Amen. The Lord. All right, verse 5. Let's, let's take off here with verse 5. And uh, it came to pass on the morrow. Remember, they were put in prison. And the next day, on the next day, on the morrow, their rulers and the elders and the scribes, all these folks that were gathered there, they're all together. And when they come together as a Sanhedrin or as a council to make this judgment, um, they've got a lot of authority. They've got a lot of pull. You remember they went before, and we've read over in the gospel messages how Jesus had to go before certain councils. He had to go before certain individuals. And then he was sent on the pile. We could go through the story of how that they done these, as we would call, court hearings uh, and such. But the scribes, they were a group of people that we look back through the Old Testament. They, they were kind of ones that copied down the word. And they were masters of it. The word, they pinned it down. They were considered a scribe. They were very knowledgeable in these scriptures as a scribe should be. And we can find a lot of scriptures all through here of how that God used these scribes in the Old Testament. And we can even go and see several places where that he used them. But that's who the scribe was. And then we go on down through here and we find that these folks that he, he was with, these elders, the rulers, and the scribes, and he pins out in verse 6, a certain individual by the name of Annas. Now, Annas, he tells us there, he's the high priest. Now, he's the one that's kind of over all the sacrifices. He's over all the rituals that take place there in the temple. And how that everything that the high priest would do there with offering the, the blood of the sacrifices, that's who Annas is. But he's got some of his family members, and it's gotten so political that he's began to pull his family in to be a part of the high priest office and they've completely uh, uh, ridiculed and annihilated how that God originally set this up in the very beginning in the Old Testament scripture and it, it's gotten clear out of whack with how that it was supposed to be with the, new, with, with the old way. And this man Annas, who was the high priest, um, we can read a lot about him and the, the, the job that he done, but we find... Caiaphas, uh, we, we can read about him. He was under the reign there, and he was related. He was, his wife was the daughter of Annas. His wife was the daughter of Annas. So this is, as we would say, Annas' daughter or son-in-law. Okay, so you see the family's getting involved, and how that he's pulling them in, and it's getting very political. So we've got Annas, the high priest, Caiaphas, his son-in-law, and John, that was another family. Now, this isn't talking about John the Apostle or John the Baptist or John Mark. This was a relative of, of Annas and of Caiaphas there. Another relative he names is Alexander. And as many as of were the kindred or the family of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. So here's this family of Annas's gathered in there, these buddies, 
And what are they doing? They're getting ready to put a judgment down with those scribes and the rulers and the elders there in Jerusalem. Okay? Comments or questions at this point? All right, verse 7. And when they, who's they, when they had set them in the midst, talking about Caiaphas and Annas and John and Alexander, the rulers, the high priest, all of these folks that were there, when they had set them in the midst, they asked, they asked Peter and John, by what power or by what name have you done this? By what power or by what name have you done this? Done what? Healed this man that, that was there. How, how has this taken place? By what power or by what name has this been done? Then Peter, he had an opportunity here. He was asked a question, and listen to what Peter does. He takes an opportunity to begin to tell them about the Lord. Now, we ought to, to take note of that in our own personal lives. We may not be able, all of us, to stand and preach a message like Peter does right here, but we ought to pray and we ought to lean upon the Lord for him to open doors for us to be able to speak of the Lord in some way in some manner in our daily walk with people that don't know him. And I promise you, if we'll pray and lean upon him, he can just take us mentioning the name of the Lord. And he can magnify that and make it have an impact on the person. You may think it's not anything. You may just say, the Lord's been awful good to me today. I'm blessed. And God can magnify that with those people and use it with power. He can. I've seen it. I've seen it take place. I had a lost lady one time. They're at school, tell in. And I didn't know this for several, several months later. So actually years later, I was, one morning, I was walking down the hall and somebody asked me how I was doing. And I said, well, I'm blessed. I'm, I'm doing well. The Lord's been awful good to me. That's all I said. Went on. And what I said there that day, I didn't know that she was even listening. I didn't know she was anywhere near me. But there was a lost lady in the room right there beside of me. And she came to me a year or two later. And she said, you know, you said something one day that really touched my heart. And you know, it wasn't me. It was the Lord's name being spoken. I said, well, what was it? Amen. She said, well, you were just walking down the hall. And somebody asked you how you were doing. And you said, I'm blessed. The Lord has been awful good to me. And she said, that really got to me that day. So you see, we don't know who's listening. We don't know who's watching. And we don't know how just the name of the Lord can be magnified and be, be by the Holy Spirit, be able to sow seeds or get somebody to thinking about what they're doing that day. Amen. So we should pray for the Lord, open doors for us. We may have doors open for us that we never know. I, I didn't even know that door had been open for me to say that and witness to that lady, but the Lord was able to use that situation and that instance right there. And how many other times have I, I you'd think how many times have I had that happen and I don't know it, but sadly, how many times have I had the opportunity to say something good about the Lord or just say how good he's been to me and I didn't do it yeah. and I've missed out on the Lord using his name to be able to reach somebody. We've all been guilty of that. Yeah. But Peter used this opportunity in verse 8. Peter stood, he, he stood up just like he did on the day of Pentecost, just like he'd done there in that temple when he started preaching to those Jews there. He's getting ready to stand right here before the very rulers of those people there and tell them about the Lord Jesus. And listen to what he does, verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, thank God for his spirit. I'm glad I felt it here tonight. It's been here. And I, I felt it fill me up, and I thank God for that. He said, by the Spirit, unto them, who? Those rulers, John, Alexander, that whole group that was there with Caiaphas and Annas. Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel. He's addressing who he's talking to. If we, this day, Peter and John, he's speaking for him and John. If we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole. If, in other words, if we're here being on trial, in verse 9 there, we're reading, if we're judged for what we've done to this crippled man and by what means he's made whole or been healed, be it known, here's the reason, here's how it happened. He's going to tell these rulers right there. 
be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified. Who's he talking to? Who's ye? He's talking to those rulers right there. He's talking to those Israelites that's there. Just like he done over there in chapter 3 when he was talking to those folks there in the middle of the temple, he got plain just the same way with them. Ye have crucified. Just like he done on the day of Pentecost in chapter 2, he stood there on the day of Pentecost and he told those Israelites that you have taken and my wicked hands have crucified. He got right down and showed them they were guilty of the sin that they had done. And we're all guilty. You've heard me say, Sister Rose Lucas used to sing the song, I was the one holding the hammer. I was the one that drove the nails in his hand. I was the one. Me and you were the one who put the crown of thorns on his head. We're all guilty of the crucifixion of our Lord because of the sin that he had upon him that day that every one of us had committed. You think of that. We're the reason he had to go through that. So he's telling them, you all need to hear here, this one that you crucified, but you may have crucified him, but he freely gave down his life. We know that. You let them know you're not going to take it, but I'll freely give it. I'll freely lay it down. Amen. Whom ye crucified, whom God raised up, raised from the dead. He's the one that brought him up on the third day. We thank God for that justification. That's why we got so excited over there when we were talking about what that he done when he defeated the last enemy called death. When we were studying about the tears being wiped away and how the, he's going to restore all things, the restitution of all things. How that the refreshing had come. The old things have passed away. The old world, the old law, the old covenant, the old way is gone. And he's established a new and living way. The law and the prophets were until John. And since that time, the kingdom of heaven has been preached. Amen. And men everywhere press into it. Christ said, of speaking of the old passed away. He said, I came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill the law. That's the purpose of him coming. And these prophets that he's about to pull right here was speaking exactly of what Jesus was talking about, fulfilling these prophecies. You've crucified him, but you've crucified him, but God has raised him from the dead, even by him. By who? By Jesus Christ. Even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. Because of the one you crucified, because of the one you put to death, is why this impotent man, this crippled man that's laid there for 40 years is able to stand here today being whole that you all knew and you knew that was crippled and you now see him walking around whole. Because of Jesus is why this is taking place. And he lets them know these boys that he's talking to knew the Old Testament scripture. They memorized it. They began to recite it. They had it stored in memory, and they could rattle it off just like a, 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 a tape player playing something off or a recording tape. They had this, these high priests and these elders and these scribes. They knew the Old Testament scriptures and knew exactly what that had said. And this is what Peter does is he goes in this message, just like us brother not to do in our preaching, as we said last week, we ought to go to the scripture, not what I think, not what I think should happen, my ideas, my philosophies, my testimony. That's all good in its place if it's in the right time and right place. But we ought to go straight to the word of God and preach. That's why Paul told Timothy, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. We could go on and talk about that. But here's what Peter does. He pulls an Old Testament passage out here when he begins to talk to them from the book of Psalms from chapter 118. And this is what the verse was that he pulls out there to them. This, this one you've crucified, that got up and has healed this man, this man, Jesus, is the stone which was set at naught of you builders. The stone that was set aside that you cast away, which has become the head of the corner. Now we could go into a long, long study here tonight on the stone. We could go to Daniel. And we could find him talking about that stone that rolled down through Babylon that tore down the kingdoms of this world. Who was that stone? Same one right here. That is Amen. Jesus. Amen. We could go back there to Moses and begin to see when he had to strike the rock and water came forth. What was that stone symbolizing or showing? 
That was showing that Jesus Christ was going to be the rock that was going to bring water. That was cleft. We sing the song. Rock of ages, cleft for me. That was the rock in a weary land. Paul made it clear who that was that followed them and that was before them. It was Jesus, the stone that the builders rejected. That a foundation had to be laid. We all know about building. He tells them right there, a foolish man that hears these sayings of mine and doesn't do them is like unto a foolish man that builds his house on the sand. And the winds come, the waves come, and it'll, it'll wash the foundation out and that house will fall. But a wise man is one that'll hear these sayings of mine and build upon a solid rock, a solid foundation. And the same winds and waves and all the floods will come against that house and that house is able to stand because it's on the rock. It's on Jesus Christ. And Paul made it clear over in Corinthians. If we had time, I'd jump over there and read it to you where he said, when that rock that followed them back there in the Old Testament scripture with Moses, he said, and that rock was Christ. So there should be no question tonight of who that rock is. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders. Set at naught means this is the one that was rejected of you builders. Remember what he's just told them. You all have taken him and crucified him. You all have destroyed him. You've beat him. You've done away with him. But the one that you, you've beat and you've done away with is the very one that's the head of the corner, the chief cornerstone. That chief cornerstone, if you know much about building, that chief cornerstone is what the whole building ties together and it holds the building right there in that foundation together. And what's the rest? We could go into the rest of that foundation tonight if we wanted to. That were built upon the foundation of the prophets of the Old Testament and the apostles of the New Testament. Who's the chief cornerstone that ties the old and the new together? It's Jesus Christ. Thank God for that. Amen. That's from the book. That, that passage that he pulls there is from the book of Psalms. Let's actually just jump over there and read that. Psalm 118. Let's run over there real quick and we'll read it. Chapter 118, verse 22. <coughs> the stone which the builders refused, that's set it not, that's just done away with, is become the headstone of the corner. It's become the headstone, the cornerstone. And he went on and said, this is the Lord's doing. This wasn't Peter's doing. This wasn't John's doing. This wasn't those high priests doing. This was the Lord's doing. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our, eye, our eyes. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. What day is that? The day that he allowed us to become founded upon this foundation that we're built upon. The day that he allowed us to stone that the builders rejected has become the head of the corner. This is the day we can rejoice in and be very glad. Thank the Lord for that, for what that he's done. All right, I just wanted you all to see over there where Peter's pulling from. He knew these scriptures too. He was a Jew and he knew those Old Testament scriptures. That's why he's pulling them in here. All right, verse 12. Before we, before we leave here, let's jump over to the book of, before I leave this chief cornerstone, I want to show you what Paul says about it. Let's jump over to the book of Ephesians real quick. Book of Ephesians chapter 2. Because Paul says about the same thing and refers to the same thing that Peter does there. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20. This is what I was referring to a while ago. Ephesians 2 and 20. He just finished telling them that we're all now fellow citizens with the saints. We're all the household of God. Remember, there's no more Jew, no more Greek. We're all in the same family now. Verse 20, he said, And are built upon the foundation of the apostles. That's the New Testament ones. Peter's one of them right here that we're studying about. And prophets. Those old ones back there that we read about in the Old Testament. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. 
So there should be no doubt in our minds tonight who that stone is. He said in 21, in whom all the building, fitly framed together, groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also, who? These Ephesians that he's talking to, and me and you tonight. In whom ye also are builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. And he wants to come in to that tabernacle. Though the earthly house of this tabernacle be dissolved, we have a building of God made with hands eternally in the heavens. For this would be grown earnestly, desiring to be clothed upon with that house, which is where? From above that's come down here now. We're in it, the church of the living God, the new Jerusalem that he speaks about. So there he speaks about that. One more place, and we'll, we'll get away from this chief cornerstone, okay? Let's go to the book of Peter, 1 Peter. That's the one we're reading about over here in chapter 4, okay? He also wrote an epistle, a letter over here. Let's go to the book of Peter, 1 Peter, chapter 2. 1 Peter, chapter 2. Verse 4. And I'm sure when Peter is writing this down right here, when he's writing to those brothers and sisters that's scattered and strangers throughout Pontus and Galatia, and all those brothers and sisters that's been scattered because of the gospel or because of the persecution, I'll almost guarantee that as he's writing the words of this letter down right here, that his mind's going automatically over here to the day he preached that message once before to that group of people that we're reading about tonight, to that chief cornerstone. So listen to what he says when he's writing this letter here. Chapter 2, verse 4. <clears throat> to whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed, disallowed means it's rejected, just like we read in the Psalms, just like we've read over there in Acts. Rejected or disallowed indeed of men, but this stone is chosen of God and precious. He tells these folks, these Christians he's talking to, and we can include ourselves in this tonight too. Ye also, as lively stones, or as living stones, are. I've circled that word are in my Bible because it's not going to be, it's not was, but we, those group, that group of Christians that he was talking to right there at that present time, they are built up a spiritual house. We tonight are built up a spiritual house in our kingdom because of what the Lord has done for us. We're built up a spiritual house. We are a holy priesthood. That high priest over there was about to be out of a job. Yeah. Annas and Caiaphas, they were about to not be needed anymore because Christ, Paul said, considered the apostle and high priest of our profession, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's took that on us today. No need for them of Caiaphas and of uh, Alexander's family anymore. We don't need that anymore. We've got Christ now. But we are a holy priesthood. Well, I thought you just said Jesus was the high priest. He is. But we're also serving under him as a priest, just like those Levites did under the high priest. We today are serving up, offering up offerings to the Lord as our bodies. He said, giving our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. To offer up spiritual sacrifices, acceptable to God by Jesus, wherefore also it is contained in the scripture. He goes right straight to the, to the verses there again. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Went on and said unto you, therefore, which believe he's precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed or rejected the same is made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. He lets us know we're a chosen generation. We're a royal priesthood. We're a holy nation. We're a peculiar people. You should show forth the Lord praises that he's called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. One more verse. Which in time past were not a people, we weren't Jews, we were Gentiles, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Thank God for what he's done for us in this living stone that he's provided Amen. for us. How good he is. All right. Let's go back over to chapter 4 and Acts. Verse 
Verse 12. Neither is there salvation in any other. The modern society does not like that. They, they teach us in, in the world that there's many religions serving the same God. There's all these religions, but they all go to the same place. That's false. Our Bible does not teach that. There's one God, and there's only one way to get to our God, and that's through His Son, Jesus Christ. You can't get to Him through Muhammad. You can't get to Him through Buddha. You can't get to Him through any of these other religions. You have to go through Jesus. Neither is there salvation in any other. Any other name, any other stone, it has to go through Jesus. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There's no way possible that we could be saved through any other name, any other God, any other religion. The only way we can get to him is through his son, Jesus Christ. And there's power. As I said a while ago, there's power in that name. And I thank God for that. Just at the name of Jesus, it can be magnified and penetrate lost hearts and begin to let them know there's something real about this. Amen. Thank God for that. Verse 13. Now, he's, this is his message. We've, we've wound up from verse 5 down to verse 12, Peter's sermon to these the high priests and the rulers and the elders. He's, he's finished his message now. He's, he's closed out his sermon. Verse 13. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, now who's they? Remember who we're talking there in verse 5 and 6. Annas, the high priest, the Caiaphas, the rulers, the scribes, the elders, all those people there in that committee or that group. When they, that group, saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned, meaning that they were uneducated and that they'd been untrained in the law like they had been, they perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men. They marveled. They were amazed. Here's these men that's mere fishermen. Peter and John were fishermen. You all know that? That's where the, Jesus found them out. They were out taking care of the fish. Peter was a fisherman. We find John and his brothers were out there doing the same thing. So they weren't taught like these elders and these scribes and all these high priests. They weren't taught the ways of the temple being a fisherman like that. They were the common everyday man. You know that's who Jesus came to all the time. Jesus was a common everyday man. He, was, he came lowly. He came humble. Born in a manger. Grew up not having a whole lot. Uh, but he came to the, to the weak and the poor. And I thank God for that. So he, they perceive these men. They're just fishermen. They're unlearned. They're ignorant of our ways. But they marveled. Knowing they were unlearned and ignorant, and they took knowledge of them. Because what Peter was saying there, there was something to it. And it wasn't Peter's knowledge, it wasn't Peter's speech there that day. It was what he said there in verse 8 Then Peter filled with the Holy Ghost. That's what caused them to marvel, and that's what caught their attention was the word he used when he pulled scripture mixed with the Holy Ghost. When you mix the Word and the Spirit of God together, there's a power there that goes into the hearts of men and women and the gates of hell can't hold it back when it goes into a person's life. The devil can't keep it from doing the work that it was ordained to do when it goes into a person's life. Only thing that can hinder it from doing its work is when we choose to, to stay where we are and not be guided by it and not be led in it. And they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Wouldn't it be good if people looked at us and said that those people have been around Jesus? Yeah. That's why they were called Christians in Antioch. Because they acted like Jesus. They talked like Jesus. They looked like Jesus. And wouldn't it be good if people saw us and said they've been with Jesus? Yeah. Why? How, how do you know they've been with Jesus? Because they don't act like everybody else acts. They're that peculiar people. They're that holy nation that Peter talked about over there in the second chapter. It'd be good if some of us would have people say, that's a real Christian. They've been with Jesus. Mm -hmm. They've been saved. I can tell when they speak that there's something different about their talk. It'd be good if people saw that. And how sad it is when people see just the opposite of that and our, our impact in our life is dimmed by our actions out there. Verse 14. Anyway, let's 
go in verse 14. And beholding the man which was healed. Here's the man that they knew had been there for 40 years. Lame, been begging. They knew who he was. And here they're thinking about these are ignorant, unlearned men. They must have been with Jesus and, and done this. And then, beholding the man which was healed, standing with them, Peter and John, they could say nothing against him. Here's the man. He's obviously been changed. He's not like he used to be. They knew this was the man that used to be there. We can't say nothing against what's taking place here. This is good that's taking place. But when they had commanded them to go aside, this committee, this, this council, commanded them, Peter and John, go aside out of the council. You all get out of here. We're going to talk amongst ourselves without you all in here. They conferred among themselves. The rulers, the scribes, the elders, Annas, Caiaphas, John, Alexander. Get out of here, Peter and John. We're going to confer amongst ourselves for a little bit. And what, this is what they said amongst themselves when they put Peter and John out. What shall we do to these men? What are we going to do with these fellows? For that indeed a notable <coughs> miracle hath been done by them is manifest. In other words, verse 16 is saying there's a remarkable miracle that's taken place here and it's manifest or it's very well known to all them that dwell in Jerusalem and we can't deny it. What's taking place here can't be denied. This man was lame and now he's walking. Just like that man, he healed his eyes that day. When they were trying to get Jesus and, and get him wrapped up with the law and all that, they came to the boy, they came to the parents first and said, what's happened here? They knew what they were doing and they were smart enough that boy's of age, you ask him what's taking place here. And they asked the boys, he said, I don't know how he done it. I don't know altogether what happened. This I do know. I was blind, but now I see. This boy right here, it's obvious that he was the lame man. They all knew, and now he's walking, and we can't deny that. But, but, they said that it spread no further among the people. Let's, let's calm this down before it starts spreading. They already knew what had happened back there in verse 4 of this chapter when about 5,000 were saved. No doubt they already knew what happened over there on the day of Pentecost when about 3,000 were saved. And all these other groups that we see saved. They saw that this was catching like wildfire. And we've not heard much from these folks up to this point. You remember they, these priests and, and scribes and the elders and the Pharisees? We saw them often over in Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John. We saw them after Jesus pretty often. Jesus died and got up. We haven't heard much from them until this point. After the day of Pentecost, why were they getting upset? The old devil does not like when the church is prospering. The old devil does not like when people are getting saved. He will try his best to hinder that. He'll try his best in any way possible to stop growth in a church. And he may work through me. He may work through you. But he'll try his best to hinder any type of growth that he can in a church. And that shouldn't be. Amen. Hath been done by them. It's manifest. All these know about it that dwell in Jerusalem. We can't <laughs> deny it. But that it spread no further among the people. Let us straightly. Let us severely threaten them. That they speak henceforth to no man in this name. Let's threaten Peter and John that they don't preach about Jesus Christ anymore. Let's threaten them. Verse 18, and they called them. Call, you remember they put them out. Peter and John, you boys come back in here. And they called them back in and they, this high priest and this group commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. You boys, don't teach, don't preach in the name of Jesus anymore. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, to this group of people, scribes and rulers and Pharisees and Amish, the high priest, whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. Pretty plain, wasn't he? He was bold. Now here's this fisherman, probably dressed not as, as finely and, and as good of apparel as these high priests were here that were very knowledgeable of the law. He's looking them rulers right in the face and says, should we listen to you or should we listen to God? You judge and you tell us what you think. But 
Peter and John answered, said, whether it be right in the sight of God, hearken unto you. Verse 20. For we, Peter and John said, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they even threat, they threatened them more, apparently, right here, after what they said up there, they threatened them. They threatened them more, and they let them go because they were finding nothing how they might punish them. This was the reason. They started getting worried because of this right here. There is safety in numbers. Yep. There's safety in a multitude of counselors. We're stronger together than we are apart. You know what, what Satan tries to do? He tries to separate us. He tries to divide us. Because that's how all these wars take place. You divide, you can conquer. Yeah. Satan uses that tactic on us in the church. He loves to divide us. He loves to drive wedges in us. He loves to get differences among brothers and sisters. And that's the work of the old devil. It's not the work of God. Amen. Because of the people, here's why. For all men glorified God for that which was done. They were all glad that this man had been healed there that day. And they were all, all these people were glorifying God of what had taken place. And because that group of people were behind Peter and John, those elders and those scribes and those Pharisees that were in that council, they feared the people if they'd done anything more to those boys there that day. Remember, there's a great group here. There's... there's 5,000 just got saved. Before that, there were 3,000. So there's a great following starting right here, and this is causing these rulers to get a little worried and concerned. For the man was above 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing was showed. This miracle of healing had taken place there. <clears throat> that word healing now, I want to throw this in there, and I'm getting ready to come to a close here. That word he, we talked about Luke. If you remember when we started in the book of Acts, we know Luke was a doctor. He was a physician. And one of the reasons that they think, they, they lean toward letting us know that Luke was the author of the book of Acts is because of this word right here, of healing. That was a medical term that they used back there. It's only used three times in the New Testament, in the Greek. It's used right here in verse 22 for the word healing. On down there in verse 30, that Greek word is used again when it said, by stretching forth thy hand to heal. That same word is used there. And then on over in the book of Luke, in chapter 13, verse 32, that same Greek word is used there and translated into our English language as healing. But over there, it's, it's translated as cure. So the cure, those three times. So this Dr. Luke, he knew a little bit about medicine. He knew how to use those words, and he was using medical terms here. You're going to find as we study through the book of Luke, or the book of Acts, I mean, he used a lot of medical terms as he went forward there. So he's, he's healing this man as he went there. All right, let's, let's stop.